Māori have always been scientists, and we continue to be scientists. Our science has allowed us to live, work and thrive in the world for hundreds of years. My name is Dr Ocean Mercier, and I'm a lecturer in Pūtaiao Māori at the Victoria University of Wellington. My job takes me all over the world to talk about Māori science and how traditional knowledge is being married with Western science here in Aotearoa in order to find innovative solutions to universal global issues. In this program, we're going to show you how these worlds of science are intersecting and how the paths to our future are being formed. The Rotorua Geothermal Field lies under both the city of Rotorua, Metepito Fakate Tonga o Te Moano Rotorua. It's unique on a world scale, made even more so because the Arawa, Tuhorangi, and Ngati Wahiao people have lived amidst the boiling geysers and pools for generations. Meteaha, Na Oa Waiariki, Kwa Muia Rato, Etehunga Tsurihi. But in recent years, over extraction of the geothermal fluid has taken a huge toll and many geysers, pools and springs have dropped off or in some cases even disappeared. Hokainga and scientists are now joining forces to monitor what is happening and to work out a plan to better manage and protect the geothermal field. Kaitemahia Brad Scott Mate Pu Ao He Kaimata Puya A Kaitemahi Tahi Hokia Ia Kinga Tangata O Fakare Wereva Kia Mara Ma Aia Kinga Papa Wayariki Otsira Kia Ora Tonu Ai Oa Papa Rotorua City and in particular the Waka and Ohinamuti villages are, are really quite unique globally. Um, I'm not really aware of anywhere else with such a high concentration of people living on top of a geothermal system in and amongst the system. The reason that we have some really large scale geothermal systems in the Rotorua Telpo area, and particularly here we are in Rotorua, is we've also got some really large scale volcanism. It's a special type of volcano called a caldera. They erupt somewhere between 50 and two or 300 cubic kilometres of rock, and they leave behind an enormous body of hot rock in the ground. That body of hot rock, just think about it like an electric element on the stove. Basically what we have underneath here is just a plume of hot water rising from the hot rock. So it's been heated up, it's like a pot sitting on an element. That water has been heated, it's creating steam and it's just rising up through the rocks that are underneath us and reaching the surface where it finds an easy way to get to the surface. And it creates what we call a surface expression of a geothermal system. So that's the surface part. That, and the piece underneath us really is just hot water and steam inside the rock. Although we utilise our natural resources, bathing facilities, um, men, women, children, communally. So that means aunties, uncles, cousins, nephews and nieces utilising our resources. Because it's a lifestyle that many people would pay a lot of money for. Uh, with the new mums and with their, their babies, they're able to sit on these seats here get the baby here and bathe the babies. And by sitting there, they get used to the water as well. This one here is with mud silt. Uh, we used to have the spa baths with uh, tourists used to come in the early 1900s. But that's been shut down now. That's with sulfur and all that too. So that sulfur was about the healing waters. And at the waka bath at the top there, those are the oil baths. you very oily to the touch, so you didn't even need to soap because of the oils and the minerals within the water. So we had three baths, you know, we can say, go up to the top bath. Well, I've got this, go down to the bottom bath. So it's about understanding and knowing the different qualities of the water. Well, it, it, that gives me my beautiful complexion. That's all I can say. <laughs> but uh, the arthritis or rheumatics, 
The old people used to take the baths and feel 100% better. And they would use those baths that we couldn't get into. It would be so hot we couldn't get into it as kids. But they'd get into it and it would be almost boiling hot. But they'd get out and they'd be, you know, really fixed to all the aches and pains would be gone. In the 1950s, New Zealand pioneered the production of electricity from geothermal systems and we didn't really think too much about the consequence. And as we developed you know, Wairaki and the Spa and Ohaki, Broadland area, Kaurau, we realised that we were actually trashing the surface features and we're destroying the surface features of our geothermal systems. And all of a sudden people realised that, oh, you know, we've had 150 geysers and we've only got five or six left. So all of a sudden, um, a whole pile of value was placed on surface geothermal features and there was a big swing from development to conservation. I roto i ngā tau ruatekau, torutekau rā nei, kua tino kūtere mai ngā tūruhi ki konei, anā, Kwa maha ake ngā hōtera me ngā ngote waiariki o roto. Kwa tino mimiti haere ngā waiariki, a kai te tino mā harahara te haukainga me ngā kaipūtai ao ki tērā. Yeah, the first um, real uh, impact we had was for us down at the Roto Atamaheke, which feeds our hirere bath, or the waterfall bath. Uh, and the water level dropped so low that there was no free flow of the water. We created some drains uh, to try and um, offset the low level, but it didn't work to a great extent. And we noticed at the same time that it was occurring with uh, what we used to call the Blue Lake, which was a big lake um, that in its deepest part was around about 15 feet that sat below the Pohutu guys in the background. And um, you might be able to see the, uh, the high water mark still showing on the, um, on the silica terraces there. One of the consequences of developing geothermal energy is that you take the fluid out of the ground rather than allow it to come to the surface to feed hot springs. And the analogy I use for that is a hose feeding a sprinkler. You have a garden hose and you have a sprinkler. And if you think of each drill hole as being a hole in that hose, eventually less water is going to come out the sprinkler and therefore there's going to be less springs. And that's really the crux of what happened in Rotorua. We had a lot of small shallow drill holes that was exploiting the geothermal system it started to draw down the geothermal aquifer and stop the springs flowing, stop the geysers erupting. The concerns were expressed uh, to the local uh, district council um, who actually supported the fact that, uh, or the assumption at the time, that the extraction of geothermal by residents and uh, commercial users was affecting the geothermal activity. And they looked at um, banning uh, they put a 1.5 uh, kilometre uh, radius around the geothermal activity and anybody within that area could not access the geothermal. Now, there was a hell of a hue and cry about that and a lot of the residents uh, understandably were very upset and there was a lot of political lobbying that uh, happened but in the end the, the decision of the regional council where it sat um, was upheld and all the uh, extraction of geothermal within a 1.5 kilometre radius of Pohutu uh, was stopped. The unique geothermal field that's shaped the way the people of Whakarewerewa live has been severely compromised by overuse. With the Hokainga teaming up with scientists from GNS, they're hopeful they can preserve the resource for generations to come. The geothermal field that's provided the people of Whakarewerewa with power and heat for centuries is under threat. Used by tourist operators and the growth of geothermal power as an energy source had combined to deplete the resource. Kei te whakamahi a te mātauranga o te haukainga me te mātauranga pūtaiao ki a mārama ai ki te nui o te tauwhirotanga. Kāore he painga i te haukainga mō te mōhio ki ngā āhuatanga o ēnei waiariki i ngā wāo mua. I always tell my children this was the best time of my life 
was living in this village, in this house here. This is where I was brought up. There were 11 in the family. I'm uh, second to last. Uh, the only one, my sister and I, the only one's born in the hospital. The rest born in the, at home here. But uh, this is our Papa Kaing. It belongs to a, a whole family, not just one family. We had our own uh, steam box, or our own microwave or ring on it. So we had all of that, so we didn't have to move far to do anything at all. Because I grew up in the Uruguera. But my, my paternal grandmother was from here. And uh, I met my husband, was born and raised here. I was frightened at first because I didn't understand the geothermal. There were the, the old ladies, there were the younger mums around my age, and the, it was full of a lot of old people. And just down there was where we used to wash our clothes. Not everyone had a washing machine. We'd come down with sheets on our back and in our sheets were our clothes like Santa Claus and our babies on the prams. And you had about four or five women sitting around and the babies in the warm water. And it was lovely because while I was there, the older women of the village and the younger mums who were there with me, they'd be talking about life in the village. They actually helped us to settle in the village. We used to piggyback all sneak around behind our mothers and, and other guides and listen to their stories and um, you know some of them were in their, their 80s and they're telling stories about when they were growing up here and what the geothermal activity was like there then um, you know that was used to be called to a great extent anecdotal evidence um, but more and more now the scientific community is accepting that people's interaction with the natural environment um, is actual um, uh, information per se and the term for that with, uh, within uh, Māori engagement is mātauranga. Uh, and it's uh, the living interactive knowledge that you gain uh, with that particular um, taonga or gift uh, or, or treasure. And in this instance, the geothermal. Te putanga iho, ko te hirere, i whakawhiua ia, raho peke. Poem, it actually, um, it retains all that history that has gone down. It retains on what is here now today. So we're able to point out to you the different locations. So that's in song and dance all the time. That retains all the history of this whole area here in terms of the hot pools. So in each hot pool, they all got a name and there's something happened in those times. <laughs> So I was sort of singing to her this morning and she was singing back to me, Turikore. So that's following that line and where we were this morning. Yeah. So they can gauge this is the flow it's taking, this is what happens, these are the names of these different lakes, this is the name of this area here where the babies are. Yeah. So that history is kept all the time. You can go even further back and then it goes on and on and on. Kwa fai hua ngā rangahau pūtaiao me ngā hotaka arotakea Brad i tēnei mātauranga. He kōrero tino hohonu tā te hau kāinga me ngā kai pūtaiao mō te huatanga mai o ngā papa waiariki ki Rotorua. Um, here we're just standing beside Parika Horu, which is the hottest and largest discharging feature in the Waka village. So this is one of the 40 pools or springs in Rotorua that we've chosen to monitor on a, a regular basis. And as this one discharges the most primary geothermal fluid coming from depth in the geothermal system, it's by far the best indicator of the health of the system here in the village. And what we do here on a regular basis is we measure the temperature and the overflow from the pool and just see how that varies with time. In the geothermal system, one of the measures of the health is the height of the geothermal system. And if the pressures are high and the height is high, that will push fluid up and springs will overflow and so therefore monitoring the overflow gives us a hint on if the system's starting to decay, we'll see a decrease in overflows. It's 
So here we're just going to take the temperature of the outflow using a, a digital thermometer and just watch the temperature rise. So we're in the 80s, 90s. So we're stabilised 93.5 degrees for the overflow here. That's a, a very typical sort of temperature for the spring. Um, it normally overflows in the low 90s. And the second measurement <coughs> we'll make here is the discharge. We've got a, a V notch here. It's a, a calibrated notch and we just measure the distance from the top of the notch down to the water level. By building up a history of the behaviour of the springs and knowing about the other things that are affecting like the number of drill holes that are open, etc. Um, we can just model the behaviour and health of the geothermal system and we can use that as a management tool to decide how much geothermal fluid can be taken from the system, how much geothermal fluid should be put back into it, are we taking too much or are we, you know, are we able to take some more. Here in the village there are two large pools, Korotiatio and Paragahoru, both of which have been used to supply water to the oil bars, that's where the people have their baths in the evening. So the overflow from these springs are captured and taken. And part of the indication that the Rotorua system is failing is when Korotiatio failed to overflow and there's no longer a discharge to feed their oil bars and we're just using Paragahoru. And then ultimately in 1987 Paragahoru also failed after the bore closure, Paragahoru has started to overflow again and has a nice healthy overflow. Korotiatio, we've seen the water level rise, but we haven't seen it rise back to overflow levels yet like it was in the 1960s. With the Western science, the extraction of the geothermal uh, and the non-re-injection would definitely affect the level of the aquifer, the, the water levels, which in turn would affect uh, the geothermal activity. Now, um, our people were also very, um, were made aware of that. And because they have uh, everyday interaction with the geothermal, they were used as um, uh, monitors by various scientists. So on a day-to-day -day basis, two or three times a day, you were getting uh, very um, exact scientific readings of the geothermal activity. So that became the interaction between the Matauta and the Western science that uh, consolidated the information to allow scientists to be more confident in their predictions uh, of factors affecting the geothermal activity. The, the monitoring regime that we have in place in Rotorua is actually to look at the health of the system and to measure whether or not the management plan is working. The whole idea of the management plan is to recover features, the surface features, enhance the behaviour of geysers and hot springs. So by monitoring the geothermal system, especially the surface expression, we're able to ascertain whether or not that monitoring plan is working. As you said, that's a two-way process. Um, we collect a lot of information about the geothermal system and we also get a lot of feedback from the local people here and the guides, the changes in the springs when we're not here and things like that. Um, our reporting on the status of the geothermal system is all fed back into the village and this building that we're actually utilising today and sharing here um, is part of our giving knowledge back to the village and it's an opportunity to share what earth science and GNS is about. Kia koua e e kore hāhā tēnei taonga, a decision was made to scale back on its use. I te ahua nei e whai huana. But the monitoring program had yet to show any true indication of how successful the management plan for the geothermal resource had been. Overuse had led to the Rotorua geothermal field losing power and a management plan had been put in place to see if it could recover. Whakarewarewa locals were desperate to see that their resource and their way of life was maintained. I whakarewa hia he mahinga ngā tahi ki te pūao ki a pai ai te arotake i ngā hua o te aukati i ngā ngote waiariki. I tēnei rā, kei te papare hia o kuiro a Brad e arotake ana. This pool here and the other features around us are actually part of the success story of the monitoring regime and the management plan for Rotorua. In the 1950s, 60s, these pools were like they are today. By the 1970s, 1980s, they dried up, people had been putting rubbish in them, there was discarded um, lawnmower chassis, push bikes, etc. And then in the early 90s, they started to fill up with water again following the bore closure program. So once the bores were shut off, the geothermal system wasn't being over-exploited and now you know, they're beautiful, hot, chloride geothermal features just as they were sort of 40 or 50 years ago. 
The geothermal features here at Kurao Park in the northern part of Rotorua City are connected, they're all part of the same geothermal system and if what we see happening here transfers up to the south end of the system, to the Walker system, then we'll have a really good positive result. Actually it took a few years before uh, the aquifer, the water levels were, had risen significantly to then re-inject activity into some of those mud pools and uh, fumaroles and geysers that, uh, that um, had suffered with the low levels. Um, we're lucky as well that we've had the opportunity to work closely with um, many of the scientific community. There's always been an interest from a scientist's perspective into understanding geothermal systems. They're, they're absolutely fascinating, beautiful features. So scientists have always been around. In the early days, I guess it was fair to say that they didn't share that knowledge as much as it's done today. The main um, knowledge gained today from our work is that we can share it with the guides and then guides can then share it with the people that are visiting. And we can explain to the guides that these springs have different types of chemistry, they've evolved in different ways, some are heated by steam, some are pure geothermal water, and they can actually pass that knowledge on to visitors and it enhances the visitors' you know, experience when they come here. Okay, well you're getting a special treat today. It's pig's head and potatoes. Now it's been in there since seven o'clock this morning. So we'll just open it up. And as long as it doesn't start squealing, we'll know it's cooked. But I prefer this, this sort of cooking, especially for meats and that. It's a natural thing. The minerals in the steam bring out the natural flavor of the food. So historically, we never put spices. We didn't have spices. So all we had was plain food and salt, salt and pepper. But that was it. And so we know what the real food tastes like. And I still cook even though I live just outside of the village and uh, my family home is looked after by my sister. Uh, I still bring my food in here to cook because it's, it's uh, something we're used to and something that's special. Now that's the pig's head. We'll leave that there now and we'll bring the vegetables. The food that we cook, we put into the hot pool to blanch. We blanch watercress, then put it in the deep freeze, take it out when we're ready and put it with the meat. And it's totally different food. Mm. That's cabbage and kamo kamo. And that's been in there for about 15 minutes. The minerals in the water bring out the natural flavor of the food. Just cool that down a bit. Right, here we have the uh, pork's head, then we have the wild pork, and then we have the kamo kamo, and the potatoes, and in here we've got the cabbage that's all been cooked in the hot water spring. It, it all fits into the sort of review of the Rotary Geothermal System, what the management plan objectives are, and it was really rewarding for us to actually see that we could recover hot springs because it wasn't really known when we shut the bores if the springs would recover. So it was a real positive for us to actually see the recovery and know that it can be done. Maybe cautiously confident that uh, in the next few years we will have the um, hard evidence or data to say, yep, uh, you can use uh, this particular tonga um, and this is how you need to use it to, uh, for its own sustainability. Uh, and, and that's one of the critical things, you know, when I uh, look behind me and I see that uh, the blue lake, there's nothing there. There's just a little puddle where it's, you know, for um, myself and my children and my mother and them, that was one of our main swimming holes. Um, because the water was warm and warmer than the river anyway, but cooler than the baths. So it was a good intermediate, uh, intermediary swimming area, but there's nothing there. Um, our baths down at the heat area uh, only now are just at a level in the lakes where they're starting to feed back, but albeit um, it takes a bit of time. We've had to dam parts of the lake to allow the water level to rise enough to so that it can feed into the bath. So the, you know, the, the natural uh, ability of the geothermal to look after itself uh, uh, is really sadly, sadly lacking and it's going to need um, some scientific support to do that. This relationship between Dharawa and GNS science has produced an outcome that's exceeded expectation. The recovery of a system that had become severely depleted can be attributed to the closing of bores that were draining it of power. 
Brad Scott's monitoring program indicates that the increase in activity seen in Quido will spread across the entire Rotorua geothermal field. A, ko te ao e matapoporeti ana ki roto o whakarewarewa, ka toi tsu tonu, whakatipuranga atu, whakatipuranga mai.